Let's get the hot take out of the way. Leica hasn't made a truly great movie since Paranorman. And Paranorman isn't nearly as good as Coraline, and Coraline was only a masterpiece because of Henry Selleck. In fact, the output of Leica over the last 15 years has been a distressing case of diminishing returns, both creatively and financially. While critics have been kind to all five of their films, there's been something hollow about them. Incomplete. Leica films are beautiful ghosts. They're amazing to look at, marvels of stop-motion innovation and limitless visual wizardry. The artisans and craftspeople involved create amazing, intricate worlds filled to the brim with exciting detail, but the stories they choose to tell in these worlds feel perfunctory, simplistic, and bland. With their latest feature a dead-on-arrival flop and no new film announced to be in the pipeline, it begs the question, what happened? Why can't Leica connect? The problems lie at every point in the pipeline. The craft, the art, and the commerce. Leica's films are gorgeous to look at. They're masterpieces of technical innovation. And Leica knows that. And they want you to know that. They hit their potential audience over the head with it at every chance they can. It's a chip on their shoulder. They want you to know that in a world filled with cheap, disposable CGI films, Leica's delicate, arduously made labors of love are a bold antidote. And that craft is impressive. Beyond impressive, noble even. But it's only half of a film. A good movie lives or dies on its story, and Leica often loses sight of that. The marketing campaign for their 2014 film The Box Troll centered heavily on this side of their process, detailing every meticulous detail of their filmmaking technique. The main trailer for the movie contains no actual dialogue or story beats, just people making the film. Every little detail, from micro to macro. Pitch this trailer with literally any live-action movie with the exception of, say, the Mission Impossible series, and you'd be laughed out of the ad agency. But this is Leica's brand. They do things the hard way, which is what makes their production shortcuts all the more baffling. For a company so opposed to making a CGI movie, they certainly use computer graphics a lot in the process. Their workflow is almost a 3D stop-motion hybrid. Every facial expression a character makes is modeled in CGI beforehand and then 3D printed. These frames are then clicked into place on the models by the animators as they animate. This means the lead animators are mostly just working on the mechanics of the body performance. This production model has infected other stop-motion films that used human characters. Isle of Dogs is the most recent example. But Leica seems to be the only company that's 100% pre-sculpting each expression on every character in the computer beforehand. It's paint by numbers for some of the most nuanced portions of character animation, and it removes a vital part of the connection between stop-motion character animation and the animators themselves. Not having the say in the expression of the character's face makes it more difficult to imbue a performance with emotion. The animators on a stop-motion film are, at heart, the performers. The actors. They are the ones crafting the emotion and the expression you see on the screen. But in a Leica film, the emotion and the motion are handled by two different departments. They're out of sync, and it shows. Leica also has a frustrating over-reliance on CGI in their post-production workflow. While some compositing can be forgiven for pure technical reasons, they frequently slap a lot of CGI on top of their animation or composite whole separate performances or characters into scenes to accomplish otherwise impossible camera movements. There's no cheating in filmmaking if it works, but for a company that boasts about their handmade bona fides, they sure do love computers. One can quibble all they want about the technical details, but here's where the real trouble starts. Leica's stories are bland, and they're getting blander by the film. It's almost like they saw how successful Coraline was and tried to reverse engineer a story template from it. What they ended up with, however, was a pale facsimile of the messy genius of Henry Selick and Neil Gaiman. Their stories tend to follow the same basic premise. A loner or an outsider makes peace with a hostile and misguided world around him, and with the exception of Coraline, it's always him, by gifting the world with his unique talent or perspective. His radical acceptance brings his community together and stitches a found family out of chaos while also saving the world in some way. It's a little bit hero's journey and a lot bit of power fantasy of the kid who was bullied in high school for being into Will Vinton. Put a pin in that. It's generally obscured by the elaborate, beautiful artifice, but it's becoming increasingly ironic that Leica keeps recycling the same story about the power of creativity. And structurally, a lot of their films suffer from that same reverse engineered from Coraline problem. Nothing really propels a lot of the quests. There's no logical progression from point A to point B. So the second acts often devolve into repetitive video gamey fetch quests or formless road movies where our heroes wander the wastes looking for the plot. In the case of Kubo and the Two Strings, we managed to get both at the same time. Leica also gets a lot of credit for how quote-unquote inclusive their stories are. For the most part, their intentions seem good and wholesome and sweet, 
but they manage to back themselves into some really unfortunate blind spots from time to time. Casting a whole bunch of white voice actors for the main cast of your Japanese-inspired folktale is kind of a bad look, and they somehow also managed to get away with a really transphobic cross-dressing villain in 2014 basically unscathed. But the root of the rot comes from where Laika's vision lies, and it feels like there simply is no vision. Laika is a company filled with some of the industry's leading animators, designers, artists, and craftspeople, but it isn't filled with the industry's leading storytellers. There isn't a strong through line of a creative voice in Laika. Travis Knight, the co-founder, CEO, and lead animator on many of the films, served as a director for Kubo and the Two Strings, but mostly pursues Hollywood fame with films like Bumblebee and the upcoming Six Billion Dollar Man. Chris Butler knocked it out of the park with Paranorman, but as the head of story for Laika, he seems unfocused. His only sole writing directing credit for the studio was Missing Link, which was both Laika's most technically impressive movie, then again, each new one is in a sense, and its most narratively uninspired. Laika lacks the strong aesthetic and storytelling knack of many of contemporary stop motion's great creatives. Nick Park and Peter Lord's DNA-level understanding of visual comedy propelled Arb into international love. Henry Selleck's distinctive style and exacting standards make him a genius, even if no one will fund him. Tim Burton is, well, Tim Burton. And Wes Anderson's hyperfixation on aesthetic perfection is only matched by his ability to wring genuine emotion out of his acerbic characters. Stack these titans next to Laika and the cracks become immediately and depressingly apparent. It's no secret that Laika doesn't make a lot of money. As the budgets keep expanding, the grosses keep getting worse. And maybe it's designed that way? Travis Knight, the CEO and president of Laika, started working at Will Vinton Studios as an animator. Before that, he was a rapper named Chili T. No, seriously. And you may remember Will Vinton from the California Raisins or that Nightmare Fuel Mark Twain movie that pops up in the internet discourse from time to time. He's basically the father of clay-based stop-motion animation, a genuine icon, a titan. In the late 90s, Vinton's studio was struggling and was looking for financial investors. Enter Phil Knight, Travis's father and the co-founder and chairman emeritus of Nike, also known as one of the 25 richest men in the world. Within a couple of years, Will Vinton was ousted from his own studio, and the Knights gained full control, rechristening it Laika. Vinton sued. It was ugly. There's a documentary about it coming out pretty soon, and there's a link to the trailer in the description. Anyway, in less than a decade, Chili T went from an intern with no previous animation skills to a board member of a stop-motion animation company, and then finally to the CEO. This isn't to say that Travis Knight isn't a great animator, he truly is. It's just funny how capitalism works sometimes. Essentially, Laika functions as a marginally profitable make-work project for a billionaire sneaker magnate's fail son. It's so clean it could be a subplot on succession. Big Kendall Roy vibes. L to the OG. But to that end, Laika has essentially no risk. There's no incentive for profit, or at the least no real consequence if it doesn't make a profit, with the exception of the low-level employees who always get the worst of these situations. It's essentially an entirely creative-focused studio. In some way, that's a comfort. An unlimited, insulated playground for artisans to practice their craft sounds like a dream. But it's also terrifying, because Laika has taken up so much oxygen in the stop-motion arena that the art form is now functionally propped up by the whims of a rich kid who's becoming increasingly bored with animation and wants to move on to big Hollywood movies. Laika's next movie is not even going to be stop-motion. This sort of top-down model leads to stagnation. There's nobody to challenge the knights, nothing stopping them from forcing these movies into 3,000 screens through various crumbling distribution deals for as long as they see fit. Or they could just close the studio tomorrow and lay off every one of their workers for no other reason than this doesn't make money anymore and we don't want to deal with selling it. Heck, Travis could decide that he wants to be Chili T again. I'm taking a track and making it fat and smoking it like some Buddha. In comparison to this model, look at Ardman, which as of 2018 is employee owned. Every employee of the company has skin in the game. They're invested and they're thriving. They may not make films with the sheer level of technical ambition as Laika, and they put out the occasional critical and commercial flop. Sorry, early man, nobody wanted a middling prehistoric soccer movie. But their work is immaculately handmade on a craft level, and they have a genuine commitment to telling compelling and affecting visual stories. They've even put out two 90-minute films with ostensibly no dialogue in the past 10 years in the form of Shaun the Sheep and Farmageddon, and they're both more structurally sound and emotionally satisfying than anything Laika has made since Coraline. 
they're also not afraid to own up to their cheating. Most of the models are made of silicone now instead of their traditional clay, but they rigorously color match the silicone to the clay that they still use for the complex, hand-animated facial expressions. They put a lot of stock in their animators as performers and give them enormous leeway to create and interpret the characters they animate. Urban also has a fully operational CG animation division that takes their legendary story sensibilities and applies them to more commercially standard films and TV shows like Flushed Away and Earth or Christmas. They also managed to not lay off any of their workers during the pandemic. Funny that. Sometimes an opinion is painful to say. Leica employs a lot of brilliant, talented people at all levels of its organization, and the argument of this video isn't to suggest that the studio should stop existing. Because there are so few studios devoted to the art of stop motion, we are forced to contend with Leica as both a producer and a patron of its art form. So they must exist in some form or another but things need to change at every point in their business. For one, they could stop making films that are essentially elaborate exercises in 3D modeling and 3D printing. The pursuit of that tech has become more limiting than I think they even realize. Either that or they need to alternate stop motion films with CGI films to give their 3D animation team the character performance skills necessary to deliver something more harmonious to the emotional intent of the film. They could also court stronger and more magnetic creative voices to run their story department, get some big name indie screenwriters on board and stop developing everything in house. Solicit spec scripts, find new story blood from beyond the limited pool in their own office. There's a core group of guys who make all of the story decisions at Leica, but they're no Pixar brain trust. Leica should also become an employee-owned studio. It's a no-brainer. The time has come to take the company out of the hands of the bored billionaires and get it into the extremely talented and dexterous hands of the people who actually make these movies. With Travis wanting to move on to Hollywood, it only makes sense to let the inmates run the asylum to see if they can sink or swim. Let the knights be more patrons of the art form and less businessmen. Perhaps they can get a sweetheart deal with a streaming service the way that Ardman has with Netflix. Somewhere that'll give them the prestige they're looking for, but also insulate them from their recent box office troubles. Leica has the potential to be America's best incubator for the next generation of stop-motion auteurs. They just need to remember that the first job of any storytelling pursuit is to, well, tell a good story. The rest will take care of itself. Thank you all for watching Too Many Tapes. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell icon to get updates for when I upload new videos. What do you think Leica needs to do? Am I totally off base? Let me know in the comments. If you want to help out a small YouTube creator, consider donating a dollar or more to my Patreon. I put every single dollar into the show, so if you like what I do, it is the absolute best way to help me make more of it. The link is in the description. If you donate 20 or more dollars a month, you're that They Might Be Giants song in the middle of Coraline, and you get to have your name in the credits in an enormous font like Chase Smith. You can also be like Nato Kitsch and have your name in an enormous font too. For $10 or more a month, you're the internalized trivia fact that Henry Selleck has sole directing credit on A Nightmare Before Christmas even though people attribute it incorrectly to Tim Burton who didn't even write the screenplay and wasn't very involved with the production. And your name gets to be pretty big in the credits too, even though everyone will just ignore that and assume that Tim Burton paid $10 a month instead. And for $5 a month, you're a Shaun the Sheep movie, Farmageddon. Because not nearly enough people are talking about how great you are. On an unrelated note, you also get early access to my videos. Thank you all again for watching and I'll see you next time on Too Many Tapes. I don't smoke sensi and I don't smoke crack. Don't get it twisted, I've been through hell, but since I stand dad, I'm alive and well.